Welcome to Gracefully Graying. I am your host, attorney and Gracefully Graying, Henry Gorenbein. Today on Gracefully Graying, we will be discussing the book, The Englishman and Detroit, how a British entrepreneur helps restore a city's confidence with my guest, John Gallagher, the author. John, welcome to Gracefully Graying. Well, Henry, thank you so much for having me on. First of all, I'm a fan of yours. I read the free press. I've had it since I was a child and I'm older than you. So it goes back many, many years. But tell us a little bit about your background for our viewers. Sure, Henry. Thank you. Well, I am a newspaper guy by background. Uh, started back in the 70s on the midnight police beat uh, back in Chicago and came to Detroit in 1987 and to work for the free press to cover Detroit's recovery efforts, uh, Detroit and Michigan's recovery efforts. And uh, basically covered the city and the state, uh, the economy, the uh, labor markets, business, urban planning uh, for 32 years, uh, retiring from the free press in December 2019. What are you doing with the next chapter of your life as you are gracefully graying? Well, thanks. Well, I'm, uh, I've got several book projects. I Along the way, over the last 20 years, I'd written several books about Detroit and uh, the Detroit's uh, possible future, the reinvention efforts. And so I've got some uh, some more books in the works, including the one I guess we're going to talk about today. I'm also doing some freelance work. Uh, I'm doing some volunteer work. I'm part of a tutoring program at Detroit Public Schools, helping second graders learn how to read. Um, and uh, I, I, as I tell my wife, I get to sleep an hour extra each night and work out a little bit more now that I'm uh, not going to the paper every day. John, what prompted you to write The Englishman in Detroit? Uh, the book which I have in my hands, How a British Entrepreneur Helps Restore a City's Confidence. Right. Well, uh, I was fascinated by uh, the Englishman of the title, a man named Rand Randall Charlton, whom we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, I met Randall back uh, when he was director of Tech Town, the business incubator, uh, back around uh, 2009 or 10, somewhere in there. Uh, and he's just a fascinating character, a uh, delightful man. And um, his story, I thought, mirrored that of Detroit. Uh, you know, for all of Detroit's challenges and problems, Detroit's done a lot of stuff right. And one of them is this, is this reinvention of, of, of an entrepreneurial ecosystem for startups, for entrepreneurs in Detroit, which didn't exist here prior to about the year 2000. And uh, I thought it was part of Detroit's uh, reinvention story, which I, I have been fascinated by for 30 some years now. So, so, um, and I enjoy writing books. I enjoy the length. I enjoy the, the depth you get writing books. Um, and so this was the project I took on and I think it's, uh, uh, you know, I'm very happy we can talk about it today. It was fascinating how you wrote about kind of Detroit going through a lot of turmoil and how really the automobile industry helped destroy Detroit in many respects. I mean, I grew up in that area. You have the freeways, you have the suburban malls first started by Northland and others. You had the racial divide. And you also had, which I noted is the fact that we had streetcars up and down Woodward. And those were sold to Mexico City, I believe in the fifties. So it's kind of a fascinating story you tell. So what I'd like to ask you now, John, is tell us a little bit about Randall Charlton, who is quite a character, for lack of a better word. Right, right. Uh, well, Randall is, uh, as I said in the title, he's an Englishman. He was born uh, about 1940, uh, just about the time that um, uh, uh, the Nazis were raining bombs down on London, which which was his home. And his, his mother took Randall and his younger sister out to a, a farm in Western England, Southwest England in Devon, to escape uh, the, you know, the Nazi blitz. And he grew up on a farm and became fascinated by animal husbandry and those kind of topics and became uh, an entrepreneur uh, dealing with all kinds of uh, agricultural sciences. He's a very forward looking kind of guy and spent about 30 years uh, traveling around the world, setting up dairy farms and places like Saudi Arabia and, and Libya and and selling, um, you know, the best DNA material to dairy farms in Australia and all that sort of thing. Then he um, had a really bad patch in his 50s where he, uh, it seemed every business he started flopped. 
and he was uh, he was financially broke. He was depressed. He was even briefly homeless. And um, uh, and about the age of sixty, then when he was wondering what was going to happen to him, uh, a friend of his who was a venture capitalist in the life sciences tracked him down and said, "Listen, I want you to start this new company for me, a, a new life sciences company in which they." Uh, supply uh, tissue samples from biopsies to pharmaceutical companies to test new possible new uh, medicines. And he needed to find the, uh, the most cost-effective lab space anywhere in the country, and that was in Detroit. Uh, so he came here in the year 2000 at the age of 60 and built this company, which became known as Astrand, uh, from one, you know, from himself and one lab assistant into a company with dozens of employees and tens of millions of dollars in, in business became Michigan's premier new life sciences startup company, and then went on to become director of TechTown, um, the business incubator at Wayne State in Detroit. And he's the one that took TechTown from, from sort of a nothing burger into this amazing hub of entrepreneurial training and activity. So he really uh, had a lot of uh, uh, influence in building up this entrepreneurial ecosystem that we now have in Detroit with a lot of venture capital and a lot of programs for startups. John, why did Detroit have to reinvent an entrepreneurial ecosystem in recent years? Well, Detroit, of course, was the um, Silicon Valley of, of the world in 1900, back when Henry Ford and <clears throat> Walter Chrysler and the Dodge Brothers and Dave Buick and all those famous names, they, they were the entrepreneurs of the early 1900s, but because of the, the, the demands of the auto industry, the capital demands uh, for these enormous industrial operations, it very quickly <clears throat> became a big company town and entrepreneurs fell out of favor. What you needed were the professional managers who could, uh, you know, who could run these enormous workforces and enormous industrial operations. Um, and it really became, um, you know, a, a major corporate town for, for almost 100 years. But um, as we know, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, that began to fall apart for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, the market share of the big three plummeted from over 90% to now under 50%. Um, and uh, Detroit and Michigan really needed to reinvent its economy, its economic model. And uh, Randall was one of the ones, among others, there's you know a bunch of other people who did this, who um, preached the idea that, well, we can do startups. Uh, as Randall said, we can reinvent Detroit one startup at a time. And so um, uh, we had to start from scratch because there were no incubators like Tech Town when he got to town. There was no venture capital in town. Um, and there were no none of these uh, pitch competitions or programs like Hatch Detroit or Motor City Match or any of those that help entrepreneurs. And the psychology of the town was still, it was still a big company town. The idea was that you, you get a job with a major corporation and you stay there for life and you get a good retirement. And the idea that you could be an entrepreneur and, uh, and take the risk of starting your own company, that was, that was pretty foreign. So that had to be reinvented. And we've done that in a, in, in a very, very successful way. As I said, it's, it's one of the things that Detroit really has done right in the last, uh, the last 20 years. John, what message do you believe Randall Charlton preaches to Detroit? Well, Randall's big message was that reinvention is possible, even, even for um, folks who are uh, you know, mid-40s, mid-50s, mid-60s, or old, older. Uh, he, he was fascinated that uh, some large percentage of the people who came through Tech Town's programs were 45 and older. Uh, you know, we think of entrepreneurs as, as sort of the the college kid in the dorm, you know, eating ramen noodles and, uh, and, and, you know, starting something in his, in his dorm room. When in fact, most entrepreneurs, at least in Detroit, are these mid-career people who, who used to be in the auto industry, perhaps in banking or something else. And <clears throat> because of the economy in Detroit was so topsy-turvy for so long, you know, had to reinvent themselves. And so Randall's message to them is that yes, reinvention is possible and that confidence is the key element that you can try something and keep at it or try it and try something else if that one doesn't work. So uh, his main message, I think, is that reinvention is, is possible. John, tell our viewers how Detroit's entrepreneurial ecosystem differs 
from other areas, such as, for example, Silicon Valley, which is always in the news. Right, right. Well, one difference is that out in Silicon Valley or in places like Boston on the East Coast, um, uh, you know, the Tech Corridor in North Carolina, those are mostly really, um, you know, high tech, digital computer uh, type startups uh, <clears throat> and lots and lots of venture capital uh, looking for them at very early stages so that you have startups in Silicon Valley that, that are barely out of the gate and getting billion dollars in venture capital. And that's not what we have here. What we have here is a lot of uh, uh, retail startups. Uh, you know, we have bridal salons and coffee shops and restaurants. <clears throat> a lot of uh, young folks doing uh, computer apps, you know, digital apps for your phone and so on. Um, a lot of personal services stuff, uh, educational training kind of programs. Uh, and so a, lot, um, a much more diverse group of uh, startup entrepreneurs. And I, and I think, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a uh, uh, much less capital up front, uh, much less venture capital uh, compared to what you might find in Silicon Valley. But we are gradually filling that in with lots of training programs and lots of uh, angel investors and lots, lots more venture capital is now finding its way here. Tell us a little bit more about the history of TechTown and where it's going. Well, uh, TechTown uh, is located in Midtown Detroit in what had been a General Motors design building. Uh, that's where the Corvette was uh, designed originally. <clears throat> and in the early 80s, um, GM had no more use for the, for the building. Uh, Detroit and Wayne State and Michigan, the state, uh, had hoped to start this uh, entrepreneurial startup scene. And um, they got together and decided, well, we'll, we'll put an uh, in, uh, a, a, a incubator, a business incubator, training and so on for entrepreneurs in this building, uh, which became known as Tech One as part of the Tech Town campus. And um, when Randall got there as director in um, 2007, 2008, it had only, you know, four or five employees, only a couple dozen entrepreneurs. And when he left uh, about four years later, they, they had 250 entrepreneurial firms uh, based there, several dozen employees, lots of, it was on a firm financial footing, and it had become the place to go for entrepreneurial training and handholding. So at Tech Town, uh, if you go there with a the startup, depending on your situation and where you are, uh, you can get some training programs, you know, how to write a business plan, how to, um, you know, do a budget, how to, you know, what you need to do to build out uh, an entrepreneurial space, um, as well as, you know, lots and lots of networking with other entrepreneurs, which is very, very important because, as Randall said, we're trying to build an entrepreneurial church here uh, where people, you know, um, uh, get the faith <laughs> that they can, they can do this. And, um, you know, many other programs have developed at Tech Town um, in recent years for minority entrepreneurs, lots of different kinds of um, pitch competitions, like on Shark Tank, where you go in and <clears throat> the winner gets uh, investment um, for their company. And, um, you know, very highly skilled people there helping entrepreneurs get started. Um, and it's part of this very broad ecosystem now which includes the New Economy Initiative, which has pumped $150 million into uh, various kinds of entrepreneurial programs. Lots of programs like Detroit's Motor City Match, where they, they match entrepreneurs with, um, with, with uh, landlords who have space where entrepreneurs need space and landlords need a tenant and they, they put them together. And uh, so it's a very broad, deep ecosystem now uh, with lots of, uh, Lots of venture capital and angel investor firms providing providing uh, investment dollars for these companies. So it's really come a very long way. And Tech Town, I think, is really part of the, you know, at the heart of that. John, what does Randall's story say about staying vital and active as those of us who are aging are gracefully graying? Right. Well, I think Randall's story shows that that it is possible that even uh, you know, as I said, at the age of sixty, he completely reinvented himself. Uh, he was at a very low point uh, in his life, at the, you know, before he got the chance to come to Detroit and do this and, and succeeded spectacularly. So, so one, one lesson is that reinvention is possible at any age. Um, 
the I think another is the the vital role of of confidence that you got to be willing to, as he puts it, sort of dive in at the deep end of the pool and and uh, you know take chances. Um, and then you also need to um, you know stay physically fit. He's he's a real exercise uh, uh, fanatic. Does his ten thousand steps a day, no matter what. Um, and uh, and that you know help is out there if you if you know where to look for it. And there's lots of places to find help right now. So so I think the message is that that seniors. Uh, gracefully graying seniors can stay just as vital uh, in their later years as they did in their younger years if they just if they just work at it. Now you mentioned earlier how he ended up in Detroit, but I guess the question is why Detroit versus you know it could have been Boston, it could have been it could have been almost anywhere right. to set up Astorand. Well, the uh, the answer is, is that uh, Detroit because Detroit's you know deep economic problems had lots of um, lots of space available and and lots of smart people who could who were available um, whereas in Boston uh, you know real estate lab lab space he needed lab lab space laboratory space um, you know hideously expensive uh, and you have to pay even you know grad students uh, who, who would be your lab assistants your lab techs you have to pay you know signing bonuses and all this I mean it's very highly expensive very difficult. <clears throat> to kind of fit in there, whereas in Detroit it was a wide open field, and uh, the state of Michigan was eager uh, to find something to reinvent the economy as the auto industry was imploding. So, <clears throat> the state of Michigan was willing to help uh, Randall uh, with with marketing and and so on, and and to promote Astoran, and um, uh, the uh, Carmanos Cancer Center had just opened in Detroit at, at Wayne State, and um, they had, you know, world-class laboratory space that was basically empty for a couple of years because uh, the, the researchers hadn't moved in yet. <clears throat> and so that was made available to him uh, for Astoran to start growing. So, so this is where he could come and, and find, you know, the best lab space in the world, some of the best uh, lab techs that were available, uh, all at a very cost-effective price. So, um, you know, this, this turned out to be, you know, the place to, the place to come. One thing I found fascinating in the book was the fact that research was always done with animals. And all of a sudden, the whole idea of Astran is, let's not do it with animals, let's do it with human tissue. And you're building a bank of human tissue literally all over the world. And it was also a situation, it was it was a success, but it was almost a disaster. And tell us a little bit about that, how, you know, there were these test runs and things just weren't going well. Right. I found that well, fascinating. Sure. Well, the idea is that uh, pharmaceutical companies that create new medicines for us, um, <clears throat> you know, test those medicines on lab animals, lab rats and so on. Uh, and, and it takes very long time. Uh, it's very expensive. Um, and it doesn't always work. Sometimes it works in, uh, on a lab mouse, doesn't work on a human being. So the idea uh, of Astrand is that if you could uh, ethically source human tissue samples from biopsies that are done routinely in hospitals around the world. Uh, so for breast cancer, let's say the, the surgeon will take a little bit of the tumor and a little bit of surrounding tissue. Uh, and some of that is left over after the biopsy is done. And if you could ethically source that and sell it to uh, pharmaceutical companies, they could test their uh, potential new medicines directly on, um, on, on, on you know, human tumors. Um, and so that's what they did. And uh, it was a very ambitious um, idea. Uh, and as you indicated, they got it wrong uh, repeatedly at the beginning. At the beginning, uh, they. Uh, they couldn't package it the right way so that they would send it to <clears throat> the tissue samples to, um, you know, to a pharmaceutical company and they'd arrive on the wrong day or the dry ice had worn out or whatever. Uh, so packaging was an issue. Labeling was an issue. Um, uh, you know, classifying the tissue samples. This is stage one or stage four or whatever. All that was an issue. Um, and for the first year or two, it, be, it was really touch and go, but it, gradually they began to refine the process. And he added uh, a new employee 
um, every month for several years. So when he left, they finally had several dozen employees and they went from <clears throat> something like $10,000 in sales the first year to, you know, a hundred thousand the next year and a couple million the next year, and, and then up to tens of millions of dollars in tissue samples. And they're the primary supplier of uh, tissue samples to um, pharmaceutical companies around the world. So Astoran is still located in Detroit. Yes, it's still here. It's now part of a much larger corporation. They don't no longer use that name, but uh, yeah, the operation is still here and it became, you know, highly successful. Bring us up to date about Randall now. What is he doing? And he's got to be, he's in his 80s now. He's, a, he's in his early 80s. He's still here, still lives here. Uh, he and his wife, Lee, um, uh, have an apartment outside London where they go um, once a year or so to visit family for a couple of months. They're both English by birth. Um, they went a year and a half ago and got stuck by the pandemic. And they actually just got back in Detroit a, a month or two ago. Um, but he's still here. He does a lot of work with the Hannon Foundation, which is a foundation in Detroit working with senior citizens. He um, helps them um, work on creative projects for seniors. Um, so our art projects, trying to encourage seniors to do their own uh, creative art art projects. Um, he's got his own book out. He, his father, it turns out, was a, a famous war correspondent for Britain uh, in World War II, and then went on to build the uh, the replica of the Mayflower, the famous ship that the Pilgrims took to uh, Plymouth Rock. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, in the 50s, Randall's father, uh, Warwick Charlton, uh, wanted to do something for America. So he, he built this replica, full-size replica of the Mayflower and sailed it across the Atlantic. And it's still in Plymouth. You can still visit it today. And it was a very famous uh, event. So uh, Randall wrote a book called The Wicked Pilgrim about his father um, and his adventures building and sailing the Mayflower across the country. So he's got that and he makes book appearances and so on. Um, so he's still, um, you know, sort of like me, he's got multiple things going all, all the time. John, what lessons can other cities take from Detroit's recent experience? Well, I think uh, one, you know, the overall lesson is, you know, the reinvention is possible, but you have to think in, in new ways. So, um, you know, Detroit was so solidly um, connected with the auto industry that that during the heyday back in the 50s and 60s, no one ever thought that the auto industry was going to go the way it, the way it did. So you have to really um, think ahead. You have to be willing to reinvent yourself. Uh, you have to think in new ways, uh, try new things, um, and and have the confidence that you can succeed. So uh, you know, in Detroit, entrepreneurship is one thing that Detroit did. Uh, we also uh, reinvented city government in interesting ways in the city of Detroit. So that, for example, things like Eastern Market and the Riverwalk and, and uh, you know, Belle Isle and, and uh, the Convention Center, all of which used to be run within city government, but run pretty inefficiently, were all spun off into private conservancies and public authorities and so on, and now are run uh, much better. Uh, we've reinvented a lot of the physical landscape of Detroit, a lot of the vacant lots became urban farms or became uh, recreational corridors like the Tequinder Cut or the Riverwalk. Um, and the economy, as I said, has been largely reinvented. I mean, we used to be strictly the automotive industry. Uh, and now, of course, we're, we're the top two mortgage lenders in the, in the, in the country, Quicken Loans and United uh, Shore are both located here. Um, and, you know, this vast, vast entrepreneurial ecosystem that we have. So, um, you know, recovery is possible, but you really need to work at it. I think that's the main lesson for other, for other cities. Clearly, a lot of positives are happening here in Detroit, though the question is, are we on the cusp of another scandal? But that remains to be seen. John, every author wants to sell their books. Uh, I've written two, and... It's one thing to write a book. It's another thing to get people to buy a book. And why should someone buy and read The Englishman in Detroit? Well, thanks, Henry. Yeah, yeah. I think there's three kinds of people who probably should buy this book. One is entrepreneurs, um, since this is, in some ways, this is uh, uh, not exactly a how-to manual, but there are case studies in this book about 
uh, when Randall built um, uh, built Astoran and then built uh, Tech Town, and also one of his businesses that failed. Uh, we go into that in some length too. So, so entrepreneurs ought to read this book. Uh, I think anyone working in in government and economic development who wants uh, to see how to help reinvent a regional economy ought to read this book because there's a lot in here about how uh, Detroit beyond Randall. I mean, a lot of a lot of the other people who started venture capital firms and what the state is doing and what the city's doing, uh, they ought to read it. And then any uh, any senior um, or someone getting toward those senior years uh, who wants to see real a real positive case study um, of how to remain vital as they gracefully gray. I think that I think those folks ought to read this book too. John, where can you obtain a copy of your book? Well, you can order it through any of your favorite local bookstores um, in Detroit. That's uh, Bookbeat in Oak Park, Pages on Grand River in the city, uh, The Source in uh, Midtown Detroit, Literati in Ann Arbor, lots and lots of places like that. Uh, and also, of course, Amazon has it. If you go to Amazon, and uh, which you can buy anything at Amazon, right? If you if you go to Amazon and look up the Englishman in Detroit, you can buy it. You can buy it from there too. I'm holding up a copy of the book now, and uh, here it is. I found it fascinating. I read all the time, and this really, you know, once I got into it, I mean, his struggles, the struggles of Detroit, it was fascinating, and I commend you on an interesting and well-written book. Before we sign off, would you give us a few takeaways about this topic for our viewers? Sure. Well, anyone who um, has any thoughts about um, starting their own business, they have an idea that they think, oh, I ought to do this. I ought to open a dress shop or a coffee shop or I can develop this app or whatever it is. Um, there's lots of places you can go for help. I mean, there's lots of these incubators around town now. Uh, in Ann Arbor, there's Ann Arbor Spark. In Oakland County, there's Automation Alley. In Detroit, there's Tech Town. Uh, so you can you call them. Call them and just, uh, you know, they'll sort of point you in the right direction. Um, and then, uh, again, just remember that, you know, you can do this. Uh, you, you can, um, uh, you know, sort of turn your life around, especially if you're having some problems as Randall had. I mean, Randall was at a very low point in his life when he came to Detroit 20, 21 years ago. So uh, you, you can do this. Uh, it's a very positive story. And uh, I think, as you said, I think it's a very encouraging story, both for individuals and for Detroit itself. John Gallagher, we're out of time. I want to thank you so much for being our guest on Gracefully Grain. And I want to thank our viewers for watching Gracefully Grain. This is a fascinating topic. And again, we look forward to sharing many, many more interesting topics. Please visit our YouTube channel and also our website at gracefullygrain.com. Thank you.